and welcome back. And today we are indeed working on the Centurion, but we're only going to focus on one small piece of it, and that is the diagnostic board. Uh, in the previous episode, I left it on a bit of a cliffhanger. I said that the entire future of the Centurion build was contingent on whether this diagnostic board was still good. We plugged it into the system, we didn't see any life out of it, and before I went any further, I wanted to pull the data off of the ROMs. But if the data on the ROMs had uh, been corrupted, then we were just totally dead in the water. And, well, I do genuinely believe that this diagnostic board is the key to cracking the entire Centurion build wide open. And, well, if I'm a bit honest, when that video went live, uh, I truly didn't know what the future of the build was. But that was about two weeks ago, and the last two weeks have been bananas so much stuff has been going on it's just oh, there's been so many times that i've just had to get up and run around in a circle because i've just been so excited uh so i guess the spoiler alert uh i didn't spoil anything specific but i guess you can probably figure out that there's a lot of really interesting really fantastic news to share with you guys. But I'm gonna bring you along on the entire story of everything that's been going on, and it all starts right here on this diagnostic board. So let's put this on the bench over there, take an in-depth look at what's going on and the ROMs, and uh, well, then we'll see why I think this thing is so important. So let's hop over there and get started. All right, so we'll start with the four ROM chips here and why I think these are so important. With the hard drives crashed and the data pretty much completely unrecoverable, there is no software that we can look at to start reverse engineering and building up an instruction set. Now, there are some ROMs on the CPU board, but these don't actually have any software on them. Centurion really liked to eliminate large collections of logic using a ROM. So the ROMs are primarily logic state machines to replicate the way that that logic was used. So that means that as of this moment, the only readable software that I have in my possession is saved on these four ROMs. So top priority was getting those ROMs out of there and dumping the contents off of them. And these ROMs are MM2716EPROMs, which means that they have a little window on the top of them that you can shine a UV light on to erase the contents. Uh, fortunately, these have stickers on top of them. Now the MM2716 is a very old ROM and modern ROM readers don't support it directly. However, I have a TL8662 and it does support an NMC27C16. This is a pin for pin drop in replacement for the old MM2716. So I can drop it into the TL8666 and read the data off of it except that I couldn't. Every time I read the data off of it, it came back different. I was in a proper panic. I was thinking that maybe the data was no good. Uh, but then it dawned on me that the original MM2716 EPROMs that are in this board have an access time of around 450 nanoseconds but the NMC27C16 has an access time of around 200 nanoseconds. So when the TL866 was trying to read these older ROMs, they couldn't keep up. They couldn't get the bits set in time. So I bought that TL866 and I have yet to use it because the solution was to build another Arduino-based EEPROM reader. Uh, this one was dead simple. I eliminated the counter chips and just used every single I.O. pin on the Arduino Nano to plug right into the chip. And then I ran it at a nice slow pace, giving the chip plenty of time to stabilize and get the bits set correctly before I copied them into the serial monitor and then on over to a hex editor. 
and the data looked like uh, this. Uh, <laughs> I, I, when I first saw it, I went, I don't know if this is good data or junk data. All I know is that it's consistent data. Every time I pull a read, it comes out exactly like this. Uh, but without knowing if it was viable data, we were still kind of in Schrodinger's computer here. It was both alive and dead. So I shared the ROMs on my Discord and we started diving into them and looking at them. And well, if Fire and Chris and 256 byte RAM were all chiming in and they said, we really think this is good real data, but we don't know how to tell for sure. And then 256 byte RAM had a light bulb moment he got to thinking that there had to be some ASCII data saved in here somewhere. But ASCII is only seven bits. The eighth bit is used as a parity bit. And since everything in here is eight bits or one byte, we can't actually see the ASCII data until we remove that eighth bit. And so he wrote a quick little piece of software that stripped that eighth bit off and turned every single byte in here into seven bits only. But if there's any ASCII lurking in there, it becomes readable. And all of a sudden, we saw this. That says CPU instruction test, CPU six mapping RAM test, ROM self test, control C to exit. Holy cow, we have viable real data and we're getting a little bit of an insight as to what is on these ROMs. This was so extremely exciting, but we can't learn anything from the stripped version other than that there's ASCII data in there but it gave us a jumping off point. And this is where we started to split into two teams working on this. Chris and Fire dug deep into the ROM data and started reverse engineering it based solely on pattern recognition, which is mind blowing to me. That is just absolutely amazing. But they didn't have the actual hardware at hand and I did. So it made more sense for me to start focusing on figuring out the hardware. And so just at first glance on the board here, I could tell we have four ROM chips right here. We have two small RAM chips down here and then a whole lot of 7400 series chips everywhere else, with the exception of this chip right here, which is an AM25LS2521. This is a wild comparator chip, and uh, it's used for some very interesting stuff. But just looking at the chips and what they can do, doesn't really help all that much. And it sure would be nice if we had a schematic to look at. But uh, this was a diagnostic board built by technicians for technicians in a company that went bankrupt 40 years ago. Uh, obviously schematics don't exist, except now one does. That is a full schematic for the diagnostic board as a whole. And if you're asking where I found it, I sat down for a week straight following every individual trace and beeping it out with my multimeter and then slowly building a schematic from there. And we learned a phenomenal amount by just looking at the schematic and the hardware. For example, yes, there's a ton of unpopulated ICs on the board. And talking with Ken, it seems like the board was designed with the intention of future proofing. Unfortunately, they went bankrupt and this is the only revision of the board that was ever made. But we can largely ignore these unpopulated ICs because they have no bearing on the CPU-6 tests. But the unpopulated ROMs actually have sockets, implying that uh, the hardware is here to select up to 13 different ROMs. And if we look in the schematic, we can see that E3 and E4 here are two 3-bit to 8-line D multiplexers, and these are used for ROM selection. And we can trace the 3-bit address that's coming into these selection chips all the way back to the card edge connector. 
Now those lines go through the collection of DS8835 chips over here on the far right. These are bus transceivers, which means that these are essentially the gateway between the address bus and the data bus that is talking with the rest of the computer and the address bus and the data bus that is on the diagnostic board itself. And then going back to the ROM selection chips, they have a 3-bit input coming into them, and we can follow that all the way back to A11, A12, and A13. So we're starting to get an idea of where within the address space this diagnostic board lives. And so after tracing out all of the hardware, we were able to figure out that the selection address for ROM F1 is hexadecimal 8000 to hexadecimal 87FF. And then the remaining unpopulated ROMs are sitting in the address spaces that come after that logically. And so that brings us all the way back around to looking at the code on the ROMs because while I was trying to figure out what address space the ROMs lived in from a hardware point of view, uh, Fire and Chris were working overtime and I cannot tell you guys how awesome the work they've been doing is. Thank you so, so much. It's just mind blowing and amazing what they've been capable of figuring out. But all while I was working on the schematic, they were slowly reverse engineering the code and then using my schematic to cross-reference and make sure that we were all on the same page. Uh, and ultimately they got to something that looked a little like this. Uh, and you may notice that that doesn't look like pure hexadecimal gobbledygook. That actually looks like readable assembly. Uh, they've been translating the original hexadecimal into readable assembly. This is... It's stunning, absolutely stunning. Uh, but I asked Fire how exactly he was able to discover that the ROMs lived in the address spaces that I just listed off without looking at the hardware. Now I'm paraphrasing here, so if something sounds horribly wrong, I apologize, it's not on Fire, it's 100% on me because the software side of this is well and truly over my head. Uh, but according to Fire, he said that the ROMs F2, F3, and F4 uh, were actually a little difficult because the code was written in such a way that it didn't really matter what address they were at. Uh, but F1 used an absolute address for its jumps and calls. So once he started to get a good handle on how the absolute jump and call instructions worked, it started to give an idea as to where F1 was located within the address space. And then working forward from there, he started to figure out how the entire address space was used across the entire diagnostic board. But then he started coming up across gaps in the address and he was trying to figure out what fit in those places. And then while looking at the code as well as the schematic, he figured out that the first gap was where the RAM chips are living. And then the remaining gap had to be MMIO. And that led us into probably the most complex part of the entire board. And that is how these three chips here and these two chips down here interact with each other. The AM25LS2521 is an 8-bit comparator chip. So what this means is that you input two 8-bit values and it compares each bit against its counterpart. And so by tying all of the two inputs to a specific value, this creates a bit mask. So that means that the other value that's coming in has to match perfectly with the preset value. And when that happens, we trigger a shift register to get some really complicated stuff going on that controls the timing and clocking of the entire board. So we can actually kind of ignore everything and just focus on what the inputs are to this black box of confusion. Uh, and we can see that the inputs are A5 through A15. And that address, counting from A15 backwards, is 11110001000. The remaining five bits can be whatever they need to be, they're ignored. 
If the address is exactly that, we kick off the MMIO. Now the shift register here on the bottom is extremely confusing, but we think it has to do with weight states. Uh, because the ROMs are 450 nanosecond ROMs, the CPU is moving at a much faster clip than the ROMs can pull data up at. So the diagnostic board has to send a signal to the CPU saying, whoa, 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 hold on for a minute. We're still retrieving what you asked. But the overall hardware and the software and the ROMs is a topic that would take weeks of video to explain. Uh, and well, so far we've just been looking at the diagnostic board. And really, I think it's in actual working condition as it is, with the exception of this little dip switch right here. It was not making continuity across it like it was supposed to. So I sprayed some uh, contact cleaner in there, flipped it back and forth a bunch, and now it's making continuity. So that, I think, is what was holding us up on this board working when we first tried it. And speaking of trying it, well, that's the next step. But we can't just plug it back in and give it a shot yet because we don't have the computer talking to the terminal correctly. So I hope to see you guys next week because the very next episode is going to continue to be Centurion related as we take a much deeper look at what's going on between the terminal and the computer and we try to get that MUX card printing something on the terminal. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope to see you in seven days.